so uh, we we continue with this proof uh, so you know so let me let me point some uh, let, let me write down something here here that i probably said but i didn't write down so you are looking at the open cover of x centered at the points x1 x2 and so on of x so which open cover is it it's the it's the open cover uh, consisting of bo open balls of radius delta okay that's something uh, i didn't uh, write down so let me write it down here so look at the open cover of uh, of uh, open balls uh, of uh, radius delta so you look at the open cover of this uh, uh, of the space x of the metric space x which is as, which we have assumed compact okay and uh, uh, you are looking at uh, the open cover which consists of open balls of radius delta that is this delta that we have uh, we have chosen uh, that we have gotten above corresponding to the epsilon or rather epsilon by 3 okay because of equal continuity okay so and you are uh, for the open cover uh, you are only looking at balls of radius delta and the centers are not uh, of course you could have taken the centers to be all points of x but then you take the centers only among the points x1 x2 and so on that's you know that's the countable dense subset of the metric space that we have cooked up okay and so this uh, is actually in in principle this is an this is a delta net for x and you know x is uh, uh, x is compact so it's totally bounded so it uh, every uh, 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 i mean it, uh, so what i'm saying is uh, it's not a delta net it will give rise to a delta net because <coughs> it is an open cover of uh, uh, open balls of radius delta okay and uh, because of compactness this open cover will give rise to a finite sub cover. So, those finite sub cover will be centered at finitely many points which uh, are among these x i's and we label those points by x i 1, x i 2 etcetera, x i m and uh, you take the balls open balls of radius delta centered at each of these finitely many m points uh, uh, and you take the union you get x that is so this so this collection uh, of points uh, finite collection of points uh, among the uh, countable dense subset okay is the, this is the, this is a delta net this is a delta net for x okay and um, well uh, we will have to work with this so what we need to show is that we need to show that you know we have to show that this uh, we, we, the whole idea is to show compactness uh, of a family of functions. So, uh, we started with an arbitrary sequence and then we tried to verify sequential compactness and we have gotten hold of this subsequence uh, this g n okay, uh, by the diagonal argument and we have to show that this subsequence uh, converges uh, uh, on all points of x at all points of x okay and uniformly and and uh, mind you the subsequence has already been cooked up in such a way that it converges on the countable dense subset okay now uh, so i'll have to show this for every small x in capital x i'll have to show that uh, for my given epsilon uh, you can choose n and m uh, sufficiently large namely greater than or equal to a certain capital n such that mod i mean the distance between gn and gm uh, 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 at uh, uh, x is can be made less than epsilon okay that is a you are just verifying that the sequence is uh, the sequence of g n s is uniformly Cauchy okay and uniformly Cauchy is uh, uh, means Cauchy with respect to the supremum norm the metric induced by the supremum norm okay. So, uh, so the point is that how do you get to an arbitrary point of x uh, whereas uh, the g n s are converging only on these points which are points among a countable sem, uh, the countable dense subset okay uh, you will have to int, uh, you have to you have to interpolate with the the x's with the x i's all right that is what you will have to do and it is done very easily by the triangle inequality. So, what will happen is that see if now you take you uh, 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 any for a for any uh, x in x okay there exists a j such that uh, the distance between x and x i j 
is less than delta. This is true, that is because these xijs, uh, xi1 through xim, that is a delta net, all right. So, there is such a j, so pick that j, take the corresponding xij and you, inter you interpolate with respect to that xij. So, now you can write out the triangle inequality, what you will get is, well, uh, well you are going to get uh, distance between uh, uh, g n of x uh, uh, and uh, well, so I, I want to I want to look at g n of x minus g m of x, so that is what I am going to write out, oops, the distance between g n of x and g m of x is that now you introduce that x i j uh, which is uh, to within a delta of x, so you write this as uh, uh, this is less than or equal to uh, g n of x uh, minus uh, g n of x i j uh, plus uh, g n of x i j minus g m of x i j plus uh, mod g m of x i j minus g m of x. So, this is how you split the triangle inequality, okay. Uh, you extrapolate, I mean you interpolate uh, the x back to itself by this x i j and then you introduced, uh, you introduce this uh, minus g n of x i j plus g n of x i j minus g m x i j plus g m x i j, okay. Uh, and now the point is that this, now you see uh, what you will have to understand is that the, uh, uh, see because of, uh, 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 you see in the first term it is the same function g n all right and uh, by equicontinuity of the family okay the distance between function values for any function in the family is going to be less than epsilon by 3 if the, 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 the distance between the arguments the variables is less than delta. So you see this is already less than epsilon by 3 okay and so is this. So the, the first and the third term are already uh, less than epsilon by 3 that is because of, this is just because of equicontinuity, due to equicontinuity. Mind you the equicontinuity is, has already been assumed for all, uh, for all functions. So, these are certain functions in that family, so it holds for them as well. Um, and then uh, the, uh, uh, so, the first term and the last term are fine and they are going to give me an epsilon, they are going to be lesser than epsilon by 3 each. The problem that I have to worry about the middle term and the, but the middle term is not a big problem because actually you know the g n, the sequence of g n, it converges on the countable dense subset of the x i s which is labeled by the points x. Therefore, these g n s are going to converge at x i j certainly, okay. So, you see, so how do you deal with this? You see g n s. Uh, converges on the countable, uh, the countable dense subset, uh, subset uh, consisting of x1, x2 and so on. So, in particular it will converge on uh, you know uh, this finite subset, okay. So, in particular on the finite subset. Uh, which is given by x i 1 etcetera up to x i m and of course, you know the, the x i j that I have chosen is in, inside this finite set, okay. But then the point is that uh, you know by definition of convergence of a sequence, I can certainly find an n, a capital N such that small n and small m greater than capital M will make sure uh, that this quantity is always less than epsilon by 3 irrespective of the x i j that I choose. That is because there are only finitely many, you may get, you will get one uh, bound, one subscript for uh, each uh, i, each j and then you take probably the maximum among, amongst all those, okay. So, uh, so there exists uh, n uh, such that uh, n comma m greater than n implies that the distance between g n of x i l and g m of x i l can be made less than epsilon by 3 if uh, yeah for all for all for all l for all l varying from 1 to m 
okay. So this can be done because uh, it can be done for each uh, xi, uh, it can be done for xi1, it can be done for xi2 and so on and for each you get a, you get an integer and then you take the maximum amongst all those, okay. There are only finite limit, this can be managed. So, so that is it, then you are done. Uh, so, uh, what this will tell you is that if uh, m and n are greater than n, okay, then what you will get is that the left hand side which is g n x minus g m x uh, is less than epsilon, okay. And mind you this is independent of x, okay, this has got nothing to do with x, uh, x did not matter, right. So this is independent of x. So, uh, this sequence g n is uniformly Cauchy. on x and that is the proof of the theorem, that ends the proof of the theorem, okay. So, we have we have demonstrated uh, sequential compactness. So, to if you to just to complete the proof uh, uh, accurately, uh, what we have shown is that we have shown that g n is uniformly Cauchy, okay, but uh, the g n's come from this subset which is already a closed subset, okay. So, but it is a closed sub subset of a complete metric space, therefore, uh, it is also complete and therefore showing that as the g n's is Cauchy is the same as showing, showing that the g n's uh, are convergent, the sequence of g n's is convergent and that is what you wanted. We started with an arbitrary family, uh, arbitrary sequence of functions from the subset and we have produced a, uh, a subsequence which converges, okay. So that is the arzela Ascoli theorem, right. Now what we need to do is that uh, we need to now go back to complex analysis and look at uh, our, uh, the kind of functions that we are interested in. We are interested in, uh, you know, uh, analytic functions uh, and then we are interested in, of course, meromorphic functions, that is our final aim. So, uh, so what does it mean for meromorphic functions? So the beautiful thing is that, you know, uh, I mean for, uh, for uh, to begin with at least let us say analytic functions, the beautiful thing is that, you know, uh, uh, see the, uh, the, 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 the main point is the following. What does Arzel Ascoli theorem say? It says that if you are for example looking at continuous bounded real valued functions on a compact uh, metric space, then uh, if you want the compact, if you want a compactness of a subspace that is a collection of functions, okay, then that is equivalent, of course that subspace has to be closed and bounded because compactness always implies closed and bounded. Okay, but what you need to extra put extra is equicontinuity. Okay, so basically, you need boundedness. You need a closed sub uh, for a closed subset to be compact. You need uh, it to be bounded, and it it, it has to be equicontinuous. That's what you want. Okay, and mind you, uh, this is a uh, this is a nice thing because uh, 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 it's easy to uh, equicontinuity is more friendlier to check rather than checking something like count uh, the total boundedness which is which is very very difficult to check okay for a family of functions it's not so easy okay so uh, now when you go to the context of complex analysis and you if, if you are looking at analytic functions what happens is something very beautiful happens see the uh, uh, what you get is you know analytic functions uh, for analytic functions you have the cauchy integral formula you have the integral formulas see these integral formulas if you if you apply the so-called integral inequality, the ML inequality, which says that the modulus of an integral is bounded by M times L, where M is the maximum modulus of the integrand on the contour of integration and L is the length of the contour of integration, okay, this is the ML inequality. If you apply this ML inequalities to the Cauchy integral formula, what you get is, what you get are called the Cauchy estimates, okay. So uh, the beautiful thing is that for analytic functions, you have Cauchy estimates, okay. And the, what these Cauchy estimates will tell you that is that if you are working on a compact set, okay, it will tell you that the derivatives are bounded, okay, because it, mind you the derivatives of an analytic function are given by the Cauchy integral formulas. The general Cauchy integral formula will give you the nth derivative, okay. So if you, therefore, you know the bound, the bounds for the derivatives are given by applying the ML inequalities to the Cauchy integral formula. So what happens is that if you have an analytic function on a on a, on a compact set, for example, on a closed disk if you want, then all the derivatives are all bounded, 
okay, all the derivatives are bounded. So what happens is that in some sense you get boundedness of derivatives but the beautiful thing is once you have boundedness of derivatives that always implies something stronger for the original functions it implies equicontinuity. So what happens is if you are working with analytic functions equicontinuity is automatic okay equicontinuity is just automatic. So you know therefore what happens is that you know just uniform boundedness will give you sequential compactness that is the big deal. The big deal is equicontinuity is comes for free if you are going to work not just with continuous functions but if you are working with analytic functions okay that is the philosophy okay that is the direction in which I am going to uh, explain how these things work. So, so, le so let me so let me make this uh, so in this in that in that generality uh, the theorem uh, the version of the Azela Ascoli theorem is, is a very important theorem it is called Montel's theorem okay. So we go on to Montel's theorem which is the key ingredient for uh, uh, proofs of many important theorems in complex analysis, analysis including of course Ray the including of course the Riemann mapping theorem and uh, uh, you know uh, the Picard theorems and so on. So let me put this Montel's theorem. So here is Montel's theorem. So uh, let uh, D in the complex plane be a domain. Of course, I am always assuming it is an open connected set and it is non empty of course okay. Uh, uh, let uh, so let script f so let script f be a family you can call it as family or collection whatever you want uh, be a family of uh, analytic functions. Uh, uh, on D which is normally uniformly bounded on D okay. So what is this normally uniformly bounded whenever you say for a certain property if you say normally that property it means that that property is to be verified not for all sets but it is it is to be verified uh, only for compact subsets okay. So when I say normally uniformly bounded on D it means that it is uniformly bounded on compact subsets of D okay. So, so let me write that that is uniformly bounded on compact subsets of D. So I am using abbreviations UFLY for uniformly BDD for bounded CPT for compact okay. So suppose it is normally bound normally uniformly bounded okay then uh, uh, you have sequential compactness okay then you have compactness basically okay but the only thing is that uh, uh, you should see compactness as sequential compactness okay and the sequential compactness in normally what does it mean it means that given any sequence you have a convergent subsequence but the only thing is here it is not just convergent on the whole you know. it will be con it the you will get a convergence okay which first of all it is a convergence of sequence of functions so it will be normal it will be a uniform convergence okay mind you whenever you are talking about convergence in for functions it is always a kind of uniform convergence alright. For example that is how it is if you are looking at the uh, continuous comp complex valued or real valued functions on a on a compact metric space okay. So it is uniform convergence but it is not again just uniform convergence but it is uniform convergence restricted only to compact subsets. So it is uniform convergence in the you know normal sense okay. So that that is the kind of sequential compactness that you will get. So that is the that is the result okay. Then every sequence in F has a subsequence that converges uniformly on compact subsets of T okay. okay. There are several little uh, subtleties in this uh, in the statement of this theorem which I will try to explain okay. Now uh, uh, 
So, so, so let me give you, uh, let us go to the proof of this, okay. So, what I want to tell you is that you see in how do you, how do you contrast this with respect to the usual Arzela Ascoli theorem? So, the usual Arzela Ascoli theorem is for functions defined on a compact metric space, okay, that is the first thing. Then the second thing is in the usual Arzela Ascoli theorem, uh, whenever you are talking about convergence, it is uniform convergence, okay, it is just uniform convergence. It means uniform convergence on the whole space, right. And the third thing is that the Arzela Ascoli theorem there is that if you want compactness, which is the same as sequential compactness, okay, that is every sequence has a convergence subsequence, that for that you will have to give uh, boundedness, which is actually uniform boundedness, okay, plus you have to give you continuity, okay. Now the big deal is when you come to complex analysis, when you come to analytic functions, I have already told you that the problem with analytic functions is that the convergence always is never uniform on a, on a, on a domain. It is only uniform when you restrict it to compact sets. So, you have to change the convergence to normal convergence. So, you must not require always convergence, you should require convergence only on compact subsets, okay. That is the first change you have to make. The second change is that you can get rid of, you do not need equicontinuity, okay. And so, you just get unif in, in a sense you are, you are saying that uniform boundedness implies sequential compactness, that is what you are saying. Okay. But the, the beautiful thing is that the sequential compactness is with respect to normal convergence, okay. that is one important thing. The other thing is the functions are not defined on a compact set, they are defined on a domain, okay. that is another difference. In the usual Arzela Ascoli theorem, you are looking at functions that are defined on a compact metric space, whereas here you are looking at analytic functions which are certainly continuous, but they are defined on not a compact set, they are defined on an open set, open connected set, okay. That is the difference. These are the differences you, you so, so now you, but you can see that the, uh, the point is that you are able to, you, when you come from the uh, re, uh, real top, uh, from, from the topological side to the complex analysis side, okay, you replace convergence, uniform convergence by normal convergence. You replace, you forget uh, equicontinuity because it comes for free, okay. So, uh, so, how does one prove this? So, the proof is very, very uh, simple. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that uh, if you are, uh, see if you are looking at a compact subset of the domain, then there is nothing great because you can directly apply Arzela Ascoli theorem, okay. Uh, and you have to use the bounded, the, the Cauchy estimates, okay. So, so for example, let me tell you, uh, uh, so suppose, uh, uh, suppose Z0 uh, is a point of D, okay, uh, let uh, rho be greater than 0 so that uh, the disk mod z minus z naught less than or equal to rho is in D, okay. You, you uh, choose uh, a sufficiently small radius so that the closed disk is, is inside D, all right. Of course, I can always find an, uh, since z naught is a point of a D, of D which is an open set, I can always, it is an interior point, so there is always a disk, open disk surrounding z naught is also in D. Now, you take a disk of slightly shorter, smaller radius, okay, and that closed disk will also be in D, okay, you can take that as your row, okay. So, uh, you, you, the reason for taking the boundary also is, you know, pretty well because then I get a compact set because a closed and bounded set, so it is compact. And once it is compact, I can apply all the hypothesis I have. So, now what happens is, watch that, you know, if I take this, uh, if you take the a family, if you look at a family of analytic functions on D and you restrict it to this this closed disk, okay, what you are getting is a family of uh, uh, continuous functions, complex valued functions, mind you analytic functions are continuous of course, okay, they are complex valued continuous functions and uh, you are restricting them to a closed disk which is a compact subset, it is also a compact metric space. So actually, you know, Arzela, you are in the situation of Arzela Ascoli theorem, the Arzela Ascoli theorem actually needs only continuous real or complex value uh, complex valued functions defined on a compact metric space okay so you are in that situation all right so since you are in that situation you are you are already given uh, that uh, the this family is normally uniformly bounded it means that it's uniformly bounded on compact subsets therefore this family is bounded on this closed disk because it's a compact subset 
So you already have boundedness, you have, you have boundedness of the family which is actually uniform boundedness, okay, you have that already. Now uh, what more do you require for uh, extracting a sub convergent subsequence from a given sequence? What you require is that uh, you, you require equicontinuity, okay? but the point is that because of analyticity and the Cauchy estimates equicontinuity is automatic. So, so, so let us let's see why that is true, you see that um, uh, so, uh, uh, so I so let me let me say the following thing. Um, uh, well, uh, a, uh, if uh, uh, z prime is uh, in the set of all z such that mod z minus z not is less than or equal to rho. Okay, you take a point here and uh, uh, then you see uh, what will happen is, uh, so you know if you want let us let us take, uh, let us take something that, um, um, That is right, so yeah fine, so what you do, so, so let me draw a diagram so that it is easier to uh, visualize, so here is, so here is my z0 and here is my closed disc center at z0 radius rho and here is my z prime, okay. Now what you do is that well, uh, 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 so notice, uh, So you can you can see you know you can choose a, a, a delta such that the uh, closed disk center at z prime radius delta lies inside this closed disk. Okay, so I can choose a delta like this. Okay, choose delta greater than zero so that uh, mod z minus z prime less than or equal to delta lies in mod z minus z naught less than or equal to rho, you can do this, okay. And then now you do the following thing, you look at uh, what is, uh, look at the Cauchy integral formula, see by the Cauchy integral formula, well this is the, well this is the, uh, the second Cauchy integral formula which is uh, for the derivative, first derivative uh, f dash of z prime okay is what it is 1 by 2 pi i integral over uh, integral in the positive sense over this circle mod z minus z prime is equal to rho delta okay of uh, f z t z by z minus z prime all right and i'm going to get uh, the whole square okay this is the first cauchy integral form right or rather second cauchy integral form the first Cauchy integral formula is for the function itself, which is a zero. Think of it as zero derivative. Okay, so this is a this is a Cauchy integral formula. This is this is true for all uh, functions f in f. This is fine. This is because after all, f is a family of analytic functions. So this is true. Now you up, now apply this. Uh, I'm just trying to write out the Cauchy estimate. So mod f of mod f prime of z prime is what this is going to be. Uh, modulus of this uh, integral, but that is uh, less than or equal to the maximum value of the integrand uh, 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 multiplied by the uh, length of the contour, which in this case is the circle of uh, radius uh, delta, okay, centered at z prime. So, what I am going to get is I am going to, I'm going to get, uh, so this is less than or equal to I am going to get 1 by 2 pi is what I am going to get if I put a mod here, and the length of the contour is well, it is a uh, No, if if you if you put a square, then it is an f prime. If you if you put so what is the Cauchy's what is the, 
See, F naught is if you put a, you know, this is this is the first formula. So if you want the nth derivative, you have to put n plus one. Okay. So what is this? So I'll get. See, if I calculate the modulus of this, I'll get mod f. Uh, Z. Okay. So so you know, let me put let me put m here. So I'm so for the modulus of fz, I'm going to get an m, okay, and then for the mod z minus z prime, the whole square. See that is mod z minus z prime is delta, because the variable of integration is z, and the variable the variable of integration lies on the uh, region of integration, which in this case is this contour, which is positively oriented. This this is the orientation, the usual positive orientation. So this is m by delta squared, okay, and I'm going to get a uh, and I am going to get the uh, the length of the contour and that is going to be 2 pi delta. Okay. So basically I am going to get m by delta and what is this m? See this m is the common bound for all the functions in your family on this closed disk, on this big closed disk that is because that is given. You see you are given that uh, look at go back go above and look at this uh, see uh, you are given you are you are given that this family f is a family of analytic functions it is normally bounded uh, normally uniformly bounded on d so it means that it is uniformly bounded on uh, every compact set on every compact subset of d so on this closed disk of uh, centered at z0 and radius rho uh, which is of course a compact subset of d it is bounded okay the all the functions are bounded i am i am taking that bound to be m so so let so let me write this where uh, m is uniform is the uniform bound uh, for all f in the functions f in this family script f on this disk centered at z0 radius uh, closed disk uh, with radius rho okay you can put this bound independent of uh, delta also okay so um, uh, you, you, you can you can so this delta that i chose seem to depend on the z prime all right but then you can get rid of this delta so that I can get a you know uniform a uh, uniform bound for the derivative f dash is as follows see the first thing that you can notice is that you know I can change this this counter of integration which is the this this smaller circle centered at z prime and radius delta to the larger circle which is mod z minus z naught is equal to rho and I can do this that because uh, of uh, the fact that f is analytic uh, uh, in the bigger closed disk and uh, uh, also uh, the point z prime is also enclosed by the by the bigger circle okay uh, so you know the the uh, therefore this formula for f dash of z prime is valid okay uh, so so in this way i have gotten rid of the delta in the integrating contour okay then the other thing is i'll have to get of the delta here appearing the bound here and so for that what i'll do is that i'll just have to restrict z prime to be with inside a you know a circle of a radius rho by two, okay, uh, from from uh, I mean centered at z naught. So uh, uh, restrict uh, you know uh, is a prime to mod z minus z naught less than or equal to rho by two, okay. If you do this, then you see this effectively makes uh, this delta which is supposed to be the you know the distance between the point z which is on the contour of integration and the point z prime which is inside the contour uh, this distance from z to z prime what will it be you see z is now going to lie on the outer contour the the uh, the outer circle and there's z prime inside okay and uh, you see the the minimum distance between z and z prime is, uh, is 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 rho by two, and therefore you know uh, so this this delta here will essentially be you know uh, uh, this delta is supposed to be the distance between it should be modulus of z minus z prime, okay, and uh, uh, that that distance is at least rho by two, all right. And uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, therefore, you know, one by delta squared will become uh, less than or equal to four by rho squared. So basically, instead of this delta squared, I'll get a rho squared, and I'll get a four here. Okay, uh, the inequality will get reversed if you take reciprocals. And of course, this 
this 2 pi delta will become 2 pi rho because that is the length of the uh, the contour the uh, which is the length of the outer circle so in in effect this bound will become 4 m by rho okay and that will become a bound that has got nothing to do with delta all right now you see of course m is the uniform bound uh, for all the functions in the family uh, on the on the bigger closed disk centered at z dot and radius rho but what does this give you you see now you calculate uh, uh, what is f of z1 minus f of z2 okay uh, what will this, this will what will this be uh, if you take uh, z1 and z2 inside this uh, 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 to be two specific instances of z prime so so here so here is z1 if you want and here is z2 okay and of course you know this integral is going to be independent of the path uh, so long as the path is uh, uh, you know uh, inside this closed disk uh, that's because f dash is uh, analytic there and uh, what will happen is that you know you're going to get uh, this is by the ml inequality this is less than or equal to integral from z1 to z2 uh, mod f dash of z uh, dz mod dz and now you know this now you can apply this bound this mod f dash of z is is less than or equal to 4 m by rho uh, uh, times uh, this mod dz is going to give you mod z1 minus z2 and that is um, uh, for example if you take the straight line segment from z1 to to z2 okay and this is valid for all z1 and z2 in this closed disk mod z minus z not less than or equal to rho by 2 okay so you see what does this tell you this tells you that the you know uh, uh, the uh, i can make the distance between fz1 and fz2 you know uh, small the moment uh, uh, small enough the moment i i can make z, the distance between z1 and z2 small enough okay and and uh, this is and in a way uh, that is independent of uh, the particular choice of z1 and z2 okay uh, and also in a way that has got nothing to do with the function f because this m is a uniform bound for all the functions okay and that is exactly uh, saying that f um, um, all the functions f the whole family of functions script f okay uh, that is equicontinuous on uh, on this uh, disk uh, centered at z0 and radius rho by 2 okay and uh, that's how you get equicontinuity for free okay see the last inequality tells you mod fz1 minus fz2 is less than or equal to some constant times z1 minus z2 okay so what that gives equicontinuity that's like a Lipschitz condition you see given an epsilon you choose carefully the delta and the way you choose delta is independent of z1 and z2 so independent of z1 and z2 you are saying the distance between f of z1 and f of f of z2 can be made lesser than epsilon whenever z1 and z2 are within a delta and independent of z1 and z2 that is equicontinuity you are see it is actually it's it's beautiful it's uniform it's it's a kind of uniform continuity because you are it doesn't you don't worry about whether it is z1 or which z1 or z2 it is and you are, it also works for all functions f so it's a kind of uniform equicontinuity that's what you get i mean that's the power of this uh, of the cauchy integral formula that you are using okay and this is what you get if you assume analyticity you get this you get e continuity just like that okay so the only thing that is left is uh, uniform uh, boundedness okay but that is already assumed so you get uh, sequential compactness but in the normal sense that's the that's the point that is model's theorem